talking a little bit about um, frailty and dementia. And the reason for this is that we know over time, many people living with dementia are, are also likely to experience frailty. And this is true if you're an older person or actually if you're somebody with, with your onset dementia too. And what we wanted to do with you is have the chance to, to have a conversation about what frailty is, um, how to spot it, what some of the signs might be, what some of the symptoms might be, some of the, the kind of characteristics. And also hear from um, Susan, who's, who's joining us this evening, to tell us a little bit about the, the kind of real lived experience and, and how that felt to her as a family member. So I'm going to invite my speakers to just come up and say hello at this point, and then I, I will start asking us some questions. So, um, Kerry, as you're first on my screen, could I ask you to just unmute and say hi? Thank you, Vic. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kerry Lyons. I am the consultant admiral nurse for frailty at Dementia UK. So relatively new post, been in post now and operational for the last four months. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to to host, co-host tonight. Thank you, Kerry. Thank, thank you so much, Kerry. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about your role and, and the work that you're doing. Susan, are, are you able to unmute and say hello? Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Ogden. Um, I was carer for my husband who lived with dementia, um, dying in a care home in 2021 in the middle of the pandemic. Thank you, Susan. It's always a relief when the people you've invited to come along and speak can actually do so when you're doing anything live. So it's a, it's a great relief to hear both of your voices this evening. I, I, should, I should just say, Vic, as well, I forgot to say that I'm also an ambassador for Dementia UK yes. and a member of their lived experience. You are indeed, Susan. And it's so much um, information and knowledge that you, you've gotten, so so much that you do for us as a charity. So thank you for all of that. And, and thank you for doing this as well this evening. Um, some, something brand new for you to do. So I hope, hope you enjoy it this evening. Um, so I'm going to start with some questions from you, Kerry, if, to you, Kerry, if I can, to, to help set the scene for people listening. And can you tell us a little bit about frailty what, what is frailty what what do we mean when we say the, the frailty yeah absolutely Vic so frailty it's a common condition um, it roughly occurs in around 50% of people over the age of 85 so given that we should all know something about it but in reality that's often not the case um, now it's really important as well that you know we note and I know that you did mention it at the start of, of the Twitter space you know that that some people may experience frailty far earlier in life, you know, due to another physical or mental health issue, um, especially, you know, when somebody is living with young onset dementia. Um, as a term, frailty is used just to describe a person's inability to bounce back from what can be a relatively minor injury or illness. And to use a couple of examples of this um, that are, are quite familiar to people, um, a fall could be that an infection, the introduction of new medication, um, e even the onset of constipation or urinary retention can, you know, really cause a, a, a person to have significant issues. So looking at it in its most simplest terms, frailty just makes us more clinically vulnerable and we're unable to then adapt to stress factors such as an acute illness um, or an injury or any changes within our circumstances. And in lots of cases, such changes are more likely to result in an adverse health outcome and possibly a loss of independence for the person. So in short, shorter lifespans, lots more complexity for people who are supporting a person living with dementia and the person living with dementia um, and often worse clinical outcomes. Now what we do know is that being able to manage frailty once it's been identified can have a really significant and positive effect on um, both the person's health and social care outcomes. So you know it's really important that we start to have more of these conversations really about what it is and what we can do about it. 
And I think one of the things you you just said there that was super interesting as well is about that how it's recognised and how because you know lots of people could potentially experience frailty and may experience frailty and and not even perhaps recognise that that they're in that situation. So, what are some of the characteristics that you, you could look out for? Or you might want people to draw people's attention towards. Yep. So. I, I'm going to talk about the key one that often people describe themselves as, which is generally okay. slowing down. And it's an often a, a descriptor that's given from families, you know, that they're noticing a change in the person that they're supporting or the person is noticing within themselves. But there are a number of different physical characteristics that you can look out for. And um, they are weight loss poor nutrition or increasing issues around nutrition um, could be hydration issues general fatigue and, and general weakness so loss of strength and balance what you find as well is that as somebody becomes increasingly physically frail then you'll find that they have a reduced physical activity and what we do know is that when frailty increases the person will steadily become more vulnerable and they'll find it harder to bounce back from illness or any changes really within the circumstances. But but the key one, Vic, in all honesty, is that general slowing down. That that's often the kind of hook on moment where you know you you can you can actually explore that with the family further as to what that actually means for them and actually what are the other issues that the person may be experiencing. It's, it makes so much sense and that you've described that beautifully, Kerry. And can I ask you to talk a little bit about what, because we, we, the other thing I've heard people talking about is um, frailty syndromes. And what's, what's, what are they? And what's the difference between the characteristics and the syndrome? Is, is that something you can explore for us for a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So the characteristics I've talked about, but, you know, for the non-clinical listeners, a syndrome is a group of characteristics, symptoms or conditions that typically go together. Now, with frailty, there are, there are five frailty syndromes. And if a person has one or more of these syndromes, it's likely that that person is living with overall frailty. So the five syndromes are falls immobility, delirium, incontinence and the susceptibility of side effects of medication. What you often find, Vic, is that somebody will not recognise these as a frailty syndrome and they won't necessarily connect it to frailty. And it's about trying to join up the dots really in terms of actually understanding is there a wider issue here that we can explore further and that will help us then plan for the future. That makes that makes so much sense. Thank you again, Kerry, and and I think that's why it's important we're having this conversation. So that if you're a healthcare professional, if you're a family member, you've got that that more awareness of what the the characteristics, what the syndromes are, so that you can you can better recognise when somebody is experiencing frailty, and 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 hopefully then make some changes or adaptations as necessary to try and try and um, reduce that or help people with that um in terms of that can i can i ask you a question about the kind of the national picture and you you mentioned some stats right at the start of the conversation but in terms of people with dementia do we know are they more at risk are they more likely are their carers more likely to experience frailty do we do we do we know any stats around that kerry yeah, so in all honesty, the, ac the accurate picture of how many people are actually living with frailty alongside dementia, it's unclear, Vic. And, and this is because in some areas, progress around screening for frailty continues to be either poor or very limited. What we do know is that several studies have reported that frailty is associated with cognitive impairments and a higher risk of dementia. And that might be explained by the fact that frailty and dementia share many risk factors. They share many clinical features, including age, inflammation, functional impairment and, and multimorbidity. What we do know, Vic, is that dementia and frailty often accompany one another in older age. So we acknowledge that 
you know, it requires better understanding and more tailored resources. You know, when we think about who is frail, and you mentioned this right at the start of, of the space, you know, it's really... Um, you know, it's actually not uncommon for a person to not recognise themselves as frail. So being able to seek out frailty through a frailty assessment tool, such as the Rockwood Clinical Frailty Scale, just to use one as an example, can help us to identify the presence of frailty as a condition. And being able to recognise frailty as a condition means that then we can do something about it. Now, you know, as we'll talk about... Um, you know, some of the work that we're doing around increasing awareness around frailty at Dementia UK, we, we really do feel that, you know, it's important to empower people to live well with frailty and, and to be able to help them understand the condition so that they can make the most of available support. And that will then enable them then to plan effectively for what are the current needs today and also what could be their future care needs. It's also really important as well to consider how we manage increasing frailty in carers also because what we know is that you know one partner may be supporting another with their own unique challenges especially if somebody's you know getting to later years um and and that you know they've both got complex health care issues and i think that that's one of the things that we, we often hear um, people talking about as, as admiral nurses isn't it we'll often hear somebody talking about the the comorbidities that they live with that their partner lives with the impact but actually what we all do because it's part of human nature very often is we just we kind of get on with things we absorb things and they change and happen over time so you, you sometimes aren't actually fully aware of of quite where things are at or, or how things are until somebody whether it's an admiral nurse or, or another specialist kind of sits next to you and says let's assess let's look into this let's let's actually really delve into what's going on here and and you get the opportunity to to hold up that mirror and and and, and have a good look because it is part of human life isn't it you 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 kind of have to get on with things and and make the most of them as much as possible um that i think sometimes means that yourself you may not or the carers might not actually recognize when a loved one actually is starting to live with frailty so it's 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 fantastic that that we're we're raising awareness and, and having this conversation and and i know it's 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 something that others are talking about too but um but fantastic to to see that happening susan can i come to you at this moment because you've sat and listened to to kerry giving some um some definitions and some <clears throat> excuse me some some clarity around some of the the terms we might hear but what what when, when you were doing that how did any of that resonate with with you and your experience of frailty well it certainly resonated um and my husband who was only 72 when he died so I guess he started with his dementia in his early 60s. He also suffered with osteoarthritis in his knees and his feet and uh, prostate problems, which were controlled with medication. Um, but at no time did anybody seem to join up the dots and think that dealing with those things and living with dementia might have made life more difficult. Uh, and when we had uh, doctor's appointments um, there was one particular doctor that we used to go to see in the practice because he was the one dealing with arthritic problems. And Peter had um, fluid drained from his knee and a cortisone injection uh, put into his knee on a fairly regular basis. And as time drew on and Peter's dementia became more advanced, although he was still able to hold a conversation, maybe very repetitive one, um, the, the last visit we had to the doctor, or the last few, there was no engagement whatsoever. Um, he didn't try to talk to Peter. Um, and when we went for prostate appointments, um, the consultant often sort of said as an aside to me, oh, of course, he has dementia, um, as if it was necessary to discuss the issues with me and disclude Peter from the discussion. So, Yes, there, um, there, there was definitely um, a lack of understanding that 
people can be living with more than one condition. Yeah, and of course people do, don't they? That's you know, and it sounds like due to the, what was going on with his knee, he would have been dealing with a, a considerable amount of pain, perhaps as well as as part of that that process. Yes, and the frustration of um, you know, he used to always overdo everything so he would wear knee bandages and rub cream into things because that was what he'd been told to do so if he was once told to do something mm -hmm. he continued doing it mm -hmm. um, you know had to do it but the pain was obviously still there and his feet started to collapse as well uh, mm -hmm. yet he was going out taking his dog for a walk on a regular basis and um, and you know trying to live the best life we could mm -hmm. And did he have any falls or anything like that during this period? And obviously you talked about immobility there or, or reduced did. mobility, sorry. He did have one trip fall, but no, falling wasn't something that he he did mm -hmm. particularly, I have to say. Um but I but but I just definitely felt that nobody ever ever saw the whole picture. Yeah. Um and that was the the main uh, discomfort for me that you know, these things did bear down on him. He worried about them. Um, I mean, when we were, he would always have to go to the loo about 10 times before we left the house, even mm -hmm. though he didn't actually ever become incontinent while he was living at home. Mm -hmm. um, but in his mind, if he didn't go, he, w he would have a problem. He wore pads, even though he probably didn't really need them. But mm -hmm. I got along with that. So it was, and the frustrations and the lack of understanding and on my behalf, um, you know, as I say, he would go to the loo and I, he would get his coat on and I would think we were ready to go out of the door and then he would have to go again. And then as soon as we arrived somewhere, that would be the first thing he would be looking for. Mm -hmm. I think these things become highlighted in in someone living with dementia mm -hmm. because they, they, they possibly don't understand entirely what is going on. Yeah, I think I think you're right, and I'm I'm going to come back to you, Kerry, um, briefly if I can, because listening to you talking then, Susan, I was thinking about the kind of stages of frailty be that somebody might go through, and 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 of course we we talked about it as a, as a as frailty as a whole thing, but of course it isn't really a whole thing, and and there is different stages, isn't there, Kerry? And I just wondered if you wanted to say anything about that at this point. Are you there, Kerry? It looks like Kerry may have been sent back to listener land. <laughs> Apologies for that. Kerry, are you able to speak? Are you able to speak, Kerry? I can, Dick. I'm really sorry. I lost connection there for a moment. Okay. <laughs> That's the joy of doing things live. It's absolutely Absolutely. No we have to, yeah, we have to love the live world, don't we? Yep. <laughs> did, you, did you hear the question I before didn't. you dropped I've her? just joined you again. So if you can just remind me of that, that would be brilliant. Yeah, so we were talking about, um, Susan had talked about the, the kind of different stages that, that they, the things they'd experienced and the things that had happened as a family. Yeah. And, and I, what I'd said was that, I, that there's something interesting where we, we often, so far, we've talked about frailty as one thing. Yeah. But yeah. Um, what I was thinking about was the different stages of frailty. And, and I, I bounced to you to ask you if you could perhaps talk to us a little bit about those those stages as well because absolutely. i think that might be helpful. yeah absolutely and you know it i mean i did i did catch a little bit of what susan was talking about and there is something about diagnostic overshadowing 
you know, and that kind of not seeing the the wider lateral picture in terms of, you know, Peter's need to have his pain managed and have appropriate treatment um, for his knees, it, you know, then led to immobility. And, and I know that, you know, Susan said that falls wasn't an issue, but it could have been an issue and it could have been a big contributory factor. Um, there are uh, three stages of frailty. Um, there's mild frailty where you'll typically see a person um, start to slow down. They need increasing help with everyday tasks such as meal preparation, housework and transport. Um, they may start to become more steady, unsteady on their feet, especially outside the home. I, and you might find that then they increasingly need to walk with an aid such as a frame or a stick. Um, moderate frailty. The person with moderate frailty will need help with all outside activities. So all elements of housekeeping and often bathing and dressing. And they will typically have difficulty with um, stairs um, going up and coming down with severe frailty a person will be dependent on others for full assistance with all aspects of their care now what is really important for us to to note and comment on is that a person's level of frailty may change over time um, it may improve or it may worsen dependent on what intervention care and support that they receive what we do know is that mild to moderate stages of frailty there are kind of modifiable windows where, you know, if we put the right intervention and support in at the right time, then we can really improve experience for those families. We can help to reduce the, the risk. We can help to maintain wellness for longer and, and help to manage some of the symptoms. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kerry. I'm going to pick up on something you said um, at there as well and, and ask a little bit more of a question but I'm going to ask you this first Susan before you say um, anything else Kerry if that's okay because I'm really interested in this idea of diagnostic overshadowing as well or people perhaps not recognizing and and did did anybody ever talk to you about um, whether whether Peter was experiencing frailty Susan or were you ever offered an assessment no, in fact, I, I hadn't heard that such a thing existed. So certainly right. never offered any such a thing. Right. Uh, each of the of Peter's um, conditions, if you like, were dealt with independently and nobody seemed to join up mm. the dots in any way. And one of the things I was picking up on that Kerry said, um, which I've only just thought of really, that Peter walked a lot with his dog um, and when we were out together, I did become aware that he was walking much more slowly. Mm -hmm. And if I said to him, because it's, it's only later, it's only possibly after the event that you think maybe that wasn't the kindest thing to do, the kindest thing to say. But we just act as we, you know, as we feel at the time. And I would say to him, you know, can you not walk any quicker? Because he was a quick walker and he would suddenly start to speed up. Mm hmm. But his brain was obviously slowing him down. Yeah. And that's the word that Kerry used uh, earlier on as well. Actually, you talked about that sort of slowing down as being that yeah. kind of mild stage. Yeah. When somebody... I didn't recognise it. Yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? And, you know, it's actually just, just those light bulbs go off and you start to think, OK. Um, and, and I think that's what makes it a bit confusing at times as well for for us all to 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 sort of recognize and and see so how is Kerry I'm going to come to you for that question now about how frailty is actually assessed what should what should happen what should that look like yep absolutely so it's really important that you know I suppose for the healthcare professionals social care professionals that are listening in tonight to to kind of actively look for the signs of frailty and in order to do that you know there are a, a whole host of assessment tools that we can we can use to do that be missed um especially you know if they are overshadowed by other long-term conditions we we know dementia is a you know is a long-term condition that often overshadows and we'll see the symptoms and the presentation of dementia but we won't see the other 
factors that you know lie under that in terms of kind of the modifiable opportunities we've got around managing some of the frailty issues that a person may be experiencing um it's really important you know to say that especially for the people that are listening in tonight that may be concerned about frailty especially in a person that they support and that you know the first step would be to make an appointment with your gp or or to you know have a conversation with with a, a healthcare professional um and they then will be able to carry out an initial assessment themselves to identify whether that person person has got frailty the stage of that frailty as well and then they can then refer that person then on to professionals for a further assessment now like I've already mentioned that you know it's often called a clinical frailty scale or a clinical frailty score uh, we use the Rockwood tool um, at the core clinical services at Dementia UK which is our National Dementia UK Helpline um, and our, our virtual clinics uh, nurses have all been trained for the use of that tool but you know there, there are a number of tools that are, are used out there and it literally is just about you know stratifying um, the, the degree of, of fitness that a person has um, and, and where they where they classify as so that mild moderate or severe um, stage and it's always um, Vic, with a view to really, you know, once frailty has been assessed and confirmed, to then be able to then refer that family on to receive a comprehensive geriatric assessment. So, you know, a CGA of, of all of their needs, um, you know, to, to ensure really that, you know, there is a holistic approach to, to what that person is experiencing. Perfect. Thank you. And the other thing I just would like it be to helpful, Vic, if I talk a little bit about comprehensive geriatric assessment? Yes, of course you can. Yes, go for it. Yep, go for it, Kerry. I think Kerry's having signal problems. Can you hear me, Kerry? Kerry's gone back to listener. So uh, while, while we're getting Kerry back up to speak again, she's obviously having some some issues this evening. Um, I was just going to pick up on what, what with both Susan and Kerry had said a little bit about diagnostic overshadowing and making sure that you don't just see the dementia, you see everything around that person. And, you know, and often, Susan, you talked about how people would address you and not Peter or they wouldn't talk to you about what was they talk, wouldn't talk to him about what was going on but come straight to you i think it's about making sure that if you're a professional working with somebody you you you, you try to keep that lens wide and not just look through this as a this is somebody with dementia so therefore the symptoms that i'm seeing could perhaps be attributed to d the dementia um kerry i know you're having technical difficulties this evening i i, I know, really I'm feel for you i can now hear you the joys of, of life yeah. i'm not yeah. entirely sure how much that you managed to to get of the how frailty is assessed did you we got to we got all of that part from the you were going to talk about the geriatric um comprehensive geriatric assessment Perfect. yeah would it be helpful <laughs> for me to to go into yes. that now so yes please. yeah so if a if a person is identified as frail they'll typically receive a full assessment of their needs now it's often referred to as the cga comprehensive geriatric assessment um i think it's really important for me to say that despite its name the assessment is also used for younger people with frailty, such as people living with young onset dementia. Um, and and it's in its most simplest terms, the CGA is a review of the person's current symptoms um, and signs of frailty, but it takes into consideration any underlying medical conditions. It's carried out by a professional or a team of professionals knowledge and expertise of um of frailty and the person with dementia and their family should always be fully consulted and involved within that cga process 
fantastic thank you Kerry I'm going to ask you to stay on um, a speaker rather than go back to um, muting yourself because that might just help with the issues can I ask you to stay in acute hospital land at the moment because I'm just interested in terms of when somebody with dementia is in hospital um, would that assessment perhaps happen in the hospital then We've lost Kerry again. So Kerry, they, I know that they've done an update over at X today on audio. So I wonder if this is what's causing Kerry some problems this evening. Hopefully she's going to to come back in again. Um, so what I was really wanting to find out a little bit about was around people in acute hospitals and, and actually the experience of, of frailty in, in acute hospitals. I can see Kerry is back in the room again. Um yeah. Kerry, I'm not sure if you did you hear my question there. I was just saying about acute hospitals, um, people um, in acute hospitals, and and whether they're more likely to be assessed for frailty while they're in hospital, or whether people are more at risk of of, of frailty whilst in hospitals. Yeah, I can I can hear you, Vic, and thank you for okay. your patience with not appalling connection issues I've got tonight. So, um. Yeah, it is actually true that there's more of a risk of being admitted to hospital when we're frail and we're living with dementia. Um, and it's really high numbers, 47% um, of hospital inpatients over the age of 85 are living with frailty. What we do know as well is research is showing us that one in four inpatient um, adult um, beds are, are occupied by a person with cognitive impairment, um, either formally diagnosed are informally diagnosed with dementia so um so what we do know so is that although we've got higher risk of being admitted to hospital when frail our needs can often be met far better outside of the hospital setting um, and this can often result in better outcomes and better experiences for families it goes with without doubt for me to say that you know somebody needs to be in hospital they need to be in hospital but it's about making sure that you know we're taking every opportunity to prevent illness to improve wellness to look at hospital at home wherever we can do um, support at home treatment at home um, and, and to give the right you know the right support to the right person at the right time uh, mm -hmm. we know currently that frailty is estimated to cost UK healthcare systems around about £5.8 billion pound a year so we're talking about huge cost um, and um, however, really high cost doesn't necessarily equate to high quality care for families who are living with dementia and frailty. So, so the big issues really are that frailty often goes unidentified. And in the main, families living with dementia and frailty often miss vital opportunities to receive that right support at the right time. Um, and, and that's a lot of, you know, the work that we're trying to do at the moment is kind of raise the profile of frailty the knowledge of frailty be able to you know a, a give the right information to families around that kind of comprehensive assessment of need how to get frailty assessed how to then seek out a comprehensive assessment of need that will help them then to plan for the future and some of that will be you know preventing unnecessary trips to a and &E, um, preventing admissions to hospital and certainly try and get people home at the right time so there's not protracted stays in hospital with what what can be an adverse outcome for the person yeah, fantastic thank you Kerry and thank you um for for bearing with the, the tech problems this evening Susan can I come to you because I know that you've got experience of um when when Peter was in hospital and um what 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 that felt like for you as as a wife um, of somebody living with, with dementia and um, perhaps an un, un, un kind of voiced or an un, untermed un frailty what 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 was your experience like um in in that hospital obviously this is historical experience of a number of years and i i, I do think that perhaps things have improved somewhat but uh, we had a very distressing experience shortly after peter 
um, was sectioned and ended up in a care home where he lived out the rest of his days. Um, he, when I was visiting visiting him daily, I noticed that um, his legs were swelling and he was just generally not himself and done well. And I pointed this out to the uh, carers at the time. Uh, and eventually they decided that uh, the only way they could deal with this was to send him to hospital, um, which I wasn't happy about. But, they, you know, they were, uh, I was his advocate, but they were caring for him. So he went to hospital. Um, it was a Friday. By the time he got there, he was actually, uh, he had actually lost consciousness. Um, and we saw a very kind uh, lady geriatrician who took me into a side room and said um, you know Susan you do realize Peter is very ill what would you like us to do and I simply said um, that you know if it was Peter's time to die then I would accept it but um, I would prefer it if he could be treated with antibiotics and fluids and just let him take his chance uh, and see how things went. That's the family, the children agreed with that. Um, and she readily agreed to that. So um, that evening, I um, I was sitting with Peter, the children went home, and at about eight o'clock, a sister came along and said, um, gave me a little visit, a little card and said, you do realise when the visiting is? And I said, well, it's immaterial because I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving Peter. You wouldn't manage him if he did wake up it would be very difficult um so she grudgingly allowed me to stay and and after that the staff I have to say were kind brought me a recliner chair and blankets and I only left Peter in the next uh four days to go home and get showered anyway on the Monday morning um Peter was still unconscious in the bed and various people had visited him over the weekend and our son was absolutely convinced that dad would pull out of this. He said, I'm absolutely sure he's not dying, but, you know, who knows? So um, a different geriatrician, a young gentleman came in, um, shook me by the hand and said, pleased to meet you, Mrs. Ogden. You do realise your husband is in the last two months of his life. And when I... Um, managed to speak following that um, I said are you using your wealth of experience in dealing with people like Peter to come to that conclusion and he said well Peter has an infection um, it's my opinion that if he recovers from this um, he will just enter a spiral of infections and will be back in here before we know it and I immediately thought yes and you don't want him in here taking up a bed and you know wasting your time um, I, I went and discussed my feelings with the hospital chaplain and various members of staff and that comment that he was in the last two months of his life was written into Peter's record. The next day, in fact that evening, Peter regained consciousness and obviously had delirium, which I didn't recognise at the time but know about now. Um, he was seeing things in the wall, he was talking incessantly, he didn't pause for breath for about six hours. He was pulling up the sheets um, and was just totally distressed. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know anything. Um, but the next morning, I asked the nurses if they would mind getting him out of the bed and putting him in the chair, which they very kindly did. And the same uh, young consultant came in, um, went up to Peter, got hold of his hand, said, oh, how nice to see you, Mr. Ogden. The blood test that we took yesterday very good so we're sending you back to Appleby which was the name of the care home this meant absolutely nothing to Peter whatsoever and I just thought oh how the worm has turned um, somebody who had consigned Peter to uh, you know not living for more than a couple of months but oh he'd made this remarkable recovery and he could go back from whence he came um, and he didn't go back into hospital until probably about a year before he died he went back in from the care home where the temperature in his room had reached 36 degrees and we were seeing this this has probably got some contributory factor to him not feeling well um, but they insisted that they sent for the ambulance and he went to hospital and that was another horrible experience because he was in a corridor 
Um, he was delirious. He was shouting and yelling the whole time. I couldn't calm him down. Nobody could. Um, and everybody, but everybody that passed, whether it was a patient, another patient, a visitor, a doctor, a nurse, they all turned and stared, which is a natural reaction, um, but very upsetting. I do think that uh, since that time, I, I did, you know, point these things out. Um, and I think that from what I've heard, people are treated with some a little more respect in our local hospital. It's it's so hard, but you've beautifully spoken about several things, really, but about what, you know, in hospital, none of us want to be in hospital. It's not great for anybody to have to have a period in hospital. But if you if you've got dementia, if you're living with dementia, it adds that that complication to to that experience because you, you might not actually understand why you're there, what's going on, what's happening, lots of noise, lots of stimulation, um, lots of people coming and going. And 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 actually the the, the story that you, 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 you illustrated around the, the doctor, um, you know, the, the this this kind of two months, um how, how long after that did Peter actually live for? Uh, almost another four years. Right. So that doctor was slightly wrong. Slightly <laughs> wrong. <yeah. laughs> slightly wrong. And it's really <laughs> hard anyway to to make that um, ever to make that call about how long somebody may or may not um, yeah. carry on living for. But but that's quite um, that, that blessedly it was it was quite off, wasn't it? Uh, Absolutely. And and having having had cancer myself and. You know, knowing that they, you know, they could make perhaps more reasoned judgments mm -hmm. as to my prospects of recovery. Mm -hmm. But I think with someone living with dementia, um, you know, Peter was a strong character, and although he had these other frailties, mm -hmm. um, I just none of us felt that that particular time was his time mm -hmm. to die. So you, as the family, as the carers, as the people who loved him and knew him best, yes, that's that was your assessment of and the situation. It, it was, and it wasn't a question of keeping him alive for us. Mm. It wasn't about that at all. Um, we were perfectly willing to accept whatever mm. the outcome was. Um, but as he was just given what we asked for, antibiotics and fluids, and did recover after four days, mm. it obviously wasn't his time to die. Yeah. it's 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 i think you've illustrated beautifully what it might be like and and actually as a family carer what you might and i have to have to put up with and the level of um I'm trying to think of the right word here but the, the the level of um character that you have to have yourself sometimes to to kind of push and fight for these things and and that resilience that you have to have in yourself at times to to kind of say, well, hang on a minute, that's that's perhaps not right, or you know, that's perhaps not how we're seeing things, and and not everybody feels able to do that, um, you know, to sort of question healthcare professionals, and you know, or, or to, you know, we we just take these things on board, don't we, and kind of think doctor knows best is still still often a feeling that that we have, and and of course in many cases they 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 do. I'm not just disrespecting that that knowledge, but I think it's just occasionally you you have to um, kind of you know perhaps question things and, and raise things a little bit and, and that's that's quite hard as well when you're when you're a family carer um Carrie, it is, exactly. can i just say that it does actually live with you too you know you you realize yeah. in, in those circumstances you are the advocate for your loved one who can't at that moment speak for himself mm -hmm. and you're so conscious of trying to do the right thing yeah yeah and i think you said earlier on something about whether it was the right thing to do or not and i think in those circumstances all of us can only ever do what we what feels right at the time can't we and you know and and you it's about making sure where possible you've got access to the right support the right information so that the the things that you say and do are, are as right as possible as right as they can be at that time absolutely and i feel you know in my experience since that time there are so many people who don't feel able 
to speak out, who, you know, are have a have a reverence towards mm-hmm. the professionals. I mean, Peter himself was a great. He we were both teachers, and Peter had the greatest of respect for other professionals. Mm-hmm. So he he would take what they said, whereas maybe he wouldn't from me or somebody else. But you know, he. he he liked to discuss when he was able to, in his early stages of dementia, what was happening, talked about synapses and all these sort of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, he would have accepted mm-hmm. if he'd been treated with respect. With the respect, yeah. And I think that they had... I felt was lacking, you know. Yeah. And I think certainly, uh, you know, I just want to mention things like you, you mentioned about visiting hours and times and chairs. And, and I know that there's a um, there's campaign uh, called John's Campaign that was rolled across many hospitals in the UK. So obviously, if, if you're in the UK listening to this, you in, in a hospital setting, you may well have heard of John's Campaign, which was around helping carers to be actively involved in, in the care when someone with dementia was in hospital to stay over to 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 have a voice in the space to, to stay and, and some some resources given to them as well um carers passports and, and such like to, to to help somebody when when a loved one was was in hospital with dementia of course covid happened and a lot of these things um stopped overnight and i think we're still perhaps picking some of these things up in in, in hospitals and you know starting to get get um you know visiting hours more relaxed and more open and and you know working in a slightly different way with with, with people again now but that's going to be patchy for for a while Kerry are you able to speak because I just I, it looks like you can is I there am- anything you want to add at this point yeah absolutely I mean I think we we are with some way to go Vic in terms of that reset post COVID but like you've said you know that they are starting to get back on track with John's campaign, Care of Passport starting to really recognise you know the the right place support and making sure that the you know the hospital staff are able to work in partnerships um, with families um, and and also as well recognising you know the importance of identifying delirium early um, and the impact active environment for a person living with dementia um so i i think we've got some way to go but you know there there is a lot of good practice out there um in terms of carer support and and better support for um you know baseline um documentation to identify a person's usual uh, behavior their likes and dislikes and and what makes them feel comfortable you know I, I, we, we've got some way to go, but I, I think, you know, we're, we're getting there slowly again. Right. And moving, so staying on that theme as well, I'd like to ask you about um, what we're doing at Dementia UK, because I think, you know, we equally, we were the same. We had some work to do around this, around um, support for people and carers in terms of frailty. But can you can you tell us a little bit about some of the work we've done at Dementia UK? Every time Kerry needs to speak, I think we're losing her at the moment. Yeah, so uh, we received lots of phone calls to our Admiral Nurse Helpline in relation to aspects of frailty. Some of these were referring to unrecognised frailty and others around carers and families not understanding the signs and symptoms of frailty syndromes Um, and with that in mind it felt a really important topic that we needed to cover moving forward Um, and we really do recognise that you know we need to help to increase knowledge and understanding of frailty that is occurring alongside dementia Um, so we've done an awful lot Vic really in the last couple of months we've trained all of our core clinical service admiral nurses at Dementia UK um, in frailty awareness, um, also in how to identify frailty and be able to signpost families um, on a call or or a virtual uh, clinic appointment, um, so that really they've got real confidence in being able to advise families um, on, you know, who to reach out to and when to do so. Um, Additionally to that, we 
have started to offer external training opportunities um, on frailty awareness, signposting, navigation um, through platforms such as the Dementia UK Summer School. Uh, we did a, a frailty um, awareness seminar for that and that's recorded and available on download. Um, all Admiral nurses who are um, working within the core clinical services and within hosted organisations also have access to a learning module on frailty um, on Blackboard. So it's very much, you know, a, a core element of their role um, as an Admiral nurse. Uh, and we're gradually starting to build our awareness, our information and our resources on frailty and dementia. We've got lots of resources now available on the Dementia UK website. Uh, and we're very, very aware that, you know, we moving forward, we want to try and you know, have an opportunity to influence UK policy, you know, on, on, on really matters that are pertaining to, to frailty and dementia. Um, and then, of course, there is the creation of my role. Um, I receive direct referrals from the Admiral Nurses within the core clinical services at Dementia UK. So that's a helpline of the virtual clinics team. And, and they are for families who are living with moderate frailty and dementia, who are experiencing significant complexity with their caregiving um, role. And, and that enables me then to offer those families a series of support appointments um, for the carer to be able to understand the condition um, and how they can support their loved one to live well with frailty um, and to manage the symptoms of increasing frailty. We also cover signposting as well and, and how they can then navigate their local services. We've also developed a Dementia UK um, frailty leaflet, um, they can, and that really covers what frailty is, assessment, planning, who can support um, and, and when they might reach out for that support. And in the back of that leaflet, we've got a really good chart that we've developed that aligns to all the areas of comprehensive geriatric assessment that helps the person to identify needs and concerns in a whole range of areas. Um, and, and that really helps the person then to identify current concerns, what help they might need in that area, um, and then what may be the plan. So who might be able to help if they have, you know, an issue in that that area in the future and that covers everything from falls to advanced care planning uh, spirituality dentition vision and hearing urinary continence so so it, it's a real you know it's a real comprehensive review of everything very much like susan said before you know that kind of not just seeing one issue independent of all others having a real good lateral look at actually you know what what is affecting the person and actually what might be able to be improved Perfect. Thank you so much, Carrie. We're, we've got a question that's come in that I've just popped in, into the top. So Rachel has uh, put, Rachel Miller has put a question in. So hopefully you can see that, Kerry. And I'm going to stay with you because I think it's probably one that's better for you to, to, to perhaps answer to. So for people who are listening to the record of this, Rachel has asked about um, when her, her, her dad's in hospital and waiting for an assessment, Lee, her dad, who is um, not eating and drinking, about him eating and drinking and how it can impact on him he's eating okay in hospital but when he comes home he doesn't eat um, very well and can get angry and confused thinking he he has eaten and it's about his ability to make decisions um and, and about his eating and drinking confusion are you able to see that question Kerry? absolutely yep yeah. i can i can see that now perfect would you like to to have a go at answering that for rachel yeah uh, absolutely um so in, I'm just having a look. To it. So when they assess him in hospital for his ability to make decisions, it's fine. However, then when he's home and he's not eating, OK, OK. So, I mean, I think it's probably really important for Rachel to, to possibly reach out to appropriate community support. If she's finding that he's not eating at home, then, you know, possibly to ask for a referral on discharge to dietitians so that they can get involved in, um, in dad's care. Um, it, it may be a number of factors, you know, it could be um, 
you know, it could be environmental, it could be, you know, to do with assisted aids for um, for eating. Um, you know, I, I think there is something about, you know, what is different in hospital compared to what is occurring at home and why he isn't eating as well um, at home. So I'm, I'm I'm just having a, a look to see what else she's she's said in there. So, um, okay, so he's been in hospital with lymphoma. He was discharged, but after not eating properly, ended up back in hospital. Uh, we're also needing a false assessment and a cognitive one, so he doesn't go back into hospital again. Okay, so I mean, I think it, I, I think you know clearly he is living with advancing frailty. Um, I think that Rachel could do with the right teams involved. I think dietitian, if there is a swallow issue, then certainly referral into speech and language therapy is really, really important um, to, to get a full assessment. That there are false teams, um, you know, connected to, to most local authority areas. She could request a, a physiotherapy referral. There is something about, you know, joining up that professional approach and, and trying to have a plan where they can, you know, manage dad at home and, and hopefully prevent unnecessary um, transfer back into hospital. Does that answer, is there anything in there, Vic, because I can see part of the question, but not yeah. all of it. Is there anything that we've not you've covered with that response? No, I think you've done a fantastic response. And what I would say to you as well, Rachel, is if you do want to to get some additional support or advice, do, do contact us at Dementia UK because, um, you know, obviously it, on a live space, we're, we're always a bit pushed. We don't want to give out too much information as well. That you, know, I mean, you can't even answer or ask extra questions as part of this. So do um, do reach out to us if, if we can help you further with, with that following the space. So we're, we're right at the end. Um, these things always go super fast. And, and it's been a fast, fantastic conversation again this evening. Can I ask final thoughts from, from both of you? So um, I'm going to give uh, the, the different questions to, slight, to both of you slightly. So Susan, I'm going to ask you as a final thought, what do you want to pe the people to leave this space thinking about? What do you what do you want them to take away from it? And Carrie, I'm going to ask you to to kind of horizon scan a little bit and, and actually what could be the national opportunities around frailty. Um, so slightly different questions for both of you. Um, Susan, are you happy to go first? Yes, absolutely. I, I think that um, as a family carer, it's just so important to realise the strength of your own voice, that you are the advocate for your loved one and you know, possibly in some cases, the only advocate because they can't speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a battle. It can be difficult. Um, but it's one that we, we just have to keep on pushing for. And on a personal level, um, we just need many more Admiral nurses mm -hmm. as they are the best. Uh, well, I'm I'm going to give you massive hearts for that because, of course, <laughs> I'm going to agree with you on, on that. Although, you know, of course, you know, providing you've got somebody who can listen to you, who can advocate for you, who can who can work with you, it makes such a big difference, doesn't it? And a hundred percent, it's always great when someone's got a carer who can advocate for them, and it, it's always that slight concern if you've not got that advocate, what what happens as well. So, thank you for some excellent final thoughts there. Kerry, um, final thoughts from you, please. Yeah, I mean, I think the big one is frailty needs to be a core element of all of our roles within health and social care. You know, it, we have to be able to signpost, educate, you know, identify frailty and then and then get people the right support at the right time. But I'm going to say three big areas, really. One, that we need to do better with screening. You know, we need to be identifying frailty. And then once we've identified clinical frailty, we need to be able to, you know, be following up that person with a comprehensive assessment of their needs that then we can plan for intervention. We can give them the right support and we can monitor them moving forward. Um, the second thing, 
thing is that we need to be preventing unnecessary admissions to hospital. And that's about, you know, planning around a person's need and, and, and really being able to, you know, be really realistic with what's appropriate in terms of, you know, escalation and not for escalation plans. And the third thing is about taking a home-based approach to care. You know, thinking about what Susan said around, you know, the absolute distress that occurs with families at the time of admission. You know, so thinking that actually when admission does need to occur, that we are not in a situation where we've got a protracted length of stay and harm is is coming to that person, you know, that we're thinking about right treatment, placement, um, right time, you know, they're, they're the three big areas for me, but, but probably the biggest one is that, you know, we have frailty on all of our agendas. Perfect. Thank you so much, everybody who has um, spoken, both Kerry and Susan. Thank you very much for the the excellent question that we were, we were asked earlier. I can see thanks popping up already um, in the in the where the questions go a bit. I don't know what that bit's actually technically called. Um, so I hope that was helpful to to you, Rachel. I, actually, I've seen it. Help. It was helpful for you to said that. So thank you. Do um, feel free to to give us any feedback on the space um what you've what you've heard and listened to and and if you do have any questions you want to ask the people who've spoken this evening about please feel free to to follow them on on x and ask them those questions as well thank you very much everybody that's all from us and i hope you have a lovely rest of your evening tonight thank you and goodbye <laughs>